we're, we're not even interested in, in cells. I mean, we're interested in DNA. DNA is not living, right? Uh, so we've passed from the notion of, I mean, in Foucaultian sense, he thinks about, you know, when we move from natural history yep. to, the, to biology, from, yep. it's, it's the beginning of, biology is about the, the, the study of life itself, right? We're beyond the study of life itself. Uh, if anything, we've grown kind of unconcerned with that. And what we're really fascinated with are these micro uh, these micromolecules inside of living things. Uh, so we've gone back to a kind of, we've, I think we've left biology at this point. I got a half jug of agar and an old PCR machine. I got a half a jug of agar in an old PCR machine. One of the more important experiments in terms of self-experimentation uh, self uh, was the development of the PCR process, the process uh, of a polymerase chain reaction in 1985, uh, credited to primarily Kerry Mullis, uh, who later won the Nobel Prize. I think of this as being a really interesting kind of uh, experiments in uh, uh, exploration or explorations in identity because not only does this technology furnish us with a lot of what we know about self-identity via uh, a lot of uh, uh, genetic mapping and genetic imaging, uh, but also uh, Kerry Mullis, the founder, was said to have um, told uh, persons that, that he had discovered this uh, under the influence of LSD uh, with a fluorescent green raccoon as a sort of spiritual muse. You want to see blue? But, 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 but glow in the dark fluorescent green raccoon. Is there something you can tell me? Mama said I could eat a marshmallow. I'm, I'm lucky, I was very lucky to have the fluorescent raccoon here because the fluorescent raccoon here told me what I needed to know that well, all the others that were doing similar kind of things with DNA and trying to find things on the genome, they were trying to amplify the signal. They kept trying to figure out how to make DNA glow more brightly and like better, making better radioactive probes and all these things. But what Mullis realized was that via the fluorescent raccoon was that what you really needed to do was to make more sample. Not more signal, but more sample. Uh, so then rather than try to amplify that signal. He amplified the sample by billions of times. The sort of primary interesting player in the PCR process is a special type of bacteria called Thermus aquaticus. Thermus aquaticus lives in almost all hot springs and the original uh, uh, strain that was used in these experiments was isolated in uh, Yellowstone National Park, actually pretty much stolen from the national parks because uh, national parks never received the billions of dollars that that organism generated. What I'm gonna be doing here is to try to find that organism, try to uh, pull out its enzymes that could be used in this TAC process or in this PCR process. Once I have those, I'm going to try to perform PCR uh, not in a lab, not in a very specialized machine, uh, as most labs would. But I'm actually going to try to perform this uh, over the campfire. When we're in the bus, we need to remember to charge the drill battery. Let's, uh, let's spark this place up. All right. Let's see, let's see what it's got. Let's see what this lab's made of. It's like you have so this is, uh, it should be out, what's called LSD 1988. Luria Bra. Nice stuff for E. coli to eat. And it also turns out that uh, the uh, TAC bacteria from my studies have seemed to thrive on this as well. This is a vitamin stock for, specifically for uh, Therm Thermus aquaticus, which is the bacteria that, that we're hoping to isolate here. So we want these things not only to be, to be able to eat, but to be able to breed. And so to do so, we need the right amount of foodstuffs for it to eat and the right amount of vitamins and minerals for, for it to, uh, that it also needs, needs to survive. Uh, TAC is a pretty interesting bacteria. It's not just your standard deal. It's a long filamentous thing. It looks like a giant snake of the, uh, or python of the bacteria world. It's got a flagella at the end so it can even move around to make it smell a little bit like the center of the earth.
I'm afraid my bacteria is pretty unisex, you know, as far as I know. There are some, some have written about the fact that it can also be a spore formulating organism, so it can have a kind of two cycle life span, but I don't understand that part of it. All I know is what it eats and what it likes to breed in. And I want to get the real classic looking stuff. I don't want the spores. I, I want the real filamentous buggers. I always find that the most important thing with all this biology stuff is just to, uh, it's just to be pretty organized about what things are which. So the Thermus aquaticus bacteria, particularly the polymerase uh, that it creates for copying its own DNA, is thermally stable at these very high temperatures. And so it's that quality that allows us to produce when we amplify DNA literally billions of copies. What's in, what, the reason this is uh, relevant to the area is that, is that the hot springs in this area are where this kind of bacteria is native. Originally, they were isolated in Yellowstone National Park, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they've since been found in many of the hot springs around. We're going to see if this one works as well as the kind of classic Yellowstone variety. Okay. This is an incubator. And we should be able to set it for whatever temperature we need. We'll probably have to monitor it a little bit, but we want to take this all the way up to 70 degrees Celsius uh, for a couple days. They like to be kind of... Um, uh, shaking around a little bit because... In the or in nature? Kind of, yeah. I mean, it, basically everything... With these things, they need to be able to get air. And so they need to be able to kind of get sometimes recycled to the surface. We'll see. We'll wait, we'll wait to see about the film. <clears throat> Just a matter of waiting. It's, it's still quite early. It hasn't even been... It's only been about 12 hours of actual heating. So we'll see. We'll see what happens in there. <laughs> so I can use standard table salt. Fine. This kind of disrupts the, the loosest dead cells in your mouth. Let's just uh, shake this up. Until nothing's on the bottom. <laughs> Something just disgusting about holding it, holding salt water in my mouth. Damn. Ugh. They're getting Jesus bigger Christ. in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ. As long as, I mean, this is a little bit disgusting, but I mean, it's only. My DNA. It's only my spit after all. Should be pretty similar heights too. So then these are gonna go into the these are gonna go in the centrifuge. I'm assuming full speed is 1400 RPMs. There's a little bit more fingers in the spit than normal. That spit stuff, so nobody should drink that. Okay. When you're done with it, you can put it in the bio waste container. We can. This little pellet there, you probably can't see it, but that's the, that little pellet at the bottom are the uh, squished up cells. What you kind of do is you flick the little stuff around there, or resuspend it into the uh, into the fluid, so that it's not so absolutely compressed. Yeah, good. When when the cells burst, it will stick to all the cell membranes, but it won't stick to the um, to the DNA. And so that when I uh, when I finally um, pull this stuff out of the hot water baths, I should be able to. I should be able to. Um, I should be able to like uh, spin it down in the centrifuge again. All the cell membranes and crap will go to the bottom, and then the DNA will be left in the fluid, and that fluid then will be what we're looking for. Okay. These are my rare, sort of more inexact thermometers. 
So this one we want to get to 100 degrees, and this one we want to get to 56 degrees. And uh, if this one gets too hot, we'll slow it down with some of that water. Oh, wait. Keep stuff rolling. Make a little mistake there, team. Nothing is ever perfect. When I put the cells in, they're a little clumpier than I wanted them to be, and they sat a little longer before I flicked them around than I wanted. And uh, yeah, it's very hard to find perfect the perfect conditions. I've yet to yet to find those. Yeah, it's a bit weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Between the salt and the uh, between the chemicals and the heat, everything should be lysed open, broken open, uh, and the uh, the beads should be. I think I think holding all the cellular components, with the exception of DNA, it should be binding to them. And then when we take it inside, we'll centrifuge it down, and we'll centrifuge it at a speed that's fast enough that all the uh, cellular crud and the beads get stuck to the bottom, but not so fast that the DNA does. And so the DNA will stay in solution. So we'll, we'll suck the DNA out of the top of the tubes, throw out the bottom, throw out the stuff at the bottom, and then we'll have four tubes of about 100 milliliters of, or uh, 100 microliters of decent usable <laughs> DNA. Amplify the signal, or the sample, not the signal. You know, that was the basis for everything in the experiment working, right? Usually, the new ones all have this conversion between the speed, the the the, the, the spinning speed, and the actual amount of g-forces it, 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 uh, it generates. Um, but this one doesn't. Sometimes, when you work with a lot of older equipment or secondhand surplus equipment that hasn't exactly been calibrated perfectly in whatever uh, you you do wind up kind of doing, you kind of learn how to use those machines and you realize that there's a, um, uh, there's a big difference, or there's a difference between this idea of like what is um, exact and what is consistent. But sometimes just being consistent is good enough. For instance, particularly with measurements, I mean, it's provided that you're using something that's off by the same uh, percentages each time, and you're measuring every single ingredient with it, then you know you're uh, you might be scaling up or scaling down, but you're actually getting the same ratios. So what I want to do is I don't want to scoop that. All that stuff is a leftover cell mass and a bunch of other crap, which we don't want. So, this, but that's one tube of. DNA for tomorrow. If you have enough lens on your camera, you can also do you know, simply one of these. We're looking through these puppies, you can simply. Uh, these are, these are the some tack. of the uh, decent images. These are some of the guys we're looking for, the tack. There, there's lots of little, I can maybe blow it up a little bit. You can see all those little wormy things. Well, I mean, it's just like any time you do this, there's always things that are imperfect, you know? And uh, this is no different. So I think in this time, it seemed imperfect that uh, the sample sat for more than 24 hours after uh, after harvesting, and that's not great. Uh, it could, and we don't know exactly how far bacteria would have traveled uh, down that spring from where they're actually really thriving. Uh, so it could be that they've been traveling for days without proper nutrients anyway. So we don't really know. So the idea here is just to try to get some quick results about if one of these, if one of these is, is viable, remember to swish them around a bit first. If one of these is actually viable, we're going to say, great, we're going to harvest up the stuff from it, and we're done, right? I mean, methylene blue is kind of a, yeah, methylene blue is kind of a classic. So I think we're going to try. Usually one drop should be perfect, and hopefully this comes out in a nice dropped form. One drop should be about perfect if this is a similar concentration to food coloring, I'm hoping. Particularly with, ooh, that's a dead mosquito, it's not. <laughs> then you want to flick it around a lot because um, if Thermus aquaticus is in there, it tends to form into big uh, matted 
kind of sheets. And so you want to knock it up or enough that um, so we can see yeah, the so we can see the individual ones. Drop about like that. Mm -hmm. And then a piece of cover slide. What we're talking about, uh, Thermos Aquaticus, it could be there. And it might have just grown very strangely because of the something about the circumstances. I'm just checking to see if anything grew in that solution we made on day one of uh, the camp here. Uh, I don't think much worked. Um, not sure why, but um, I'm going to double check before I say it didn't work. Got it. Just turned out to be the uh, cleansing and the good cleaning. <sighs> Yeah. Two different sets of PCR reactions we'll do, we'll do today. Mark. I don't even want to get out. So this is what you made this afternoon? Yeah. Okay. This is everything needed for the PCR reaction. Usually everything's written down in really precise format. Oh. Usually I would make a, oh. an actual log of exactly how much of everything needed to go into each tube. In this case, I've done this enough times, and the uh, yeah. the level of, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to be a little more casual here yeah. in the woods. Yeah, so I'm kind of uh, modifying my own recipe on the fly, which is, again, it's not, don't try this at home. Um, this is. A lot of tricky math to keep keeping your head. So I'm kind of trying to do all these uh, sort of in my head right now, just sort of keeping track of the numbers. So I'm hoping we don't get into trouble. So like a lot of times if you're doing a big PCR experiment, you're doing 60 different tubes of stuff, so there's a little bit more um, potential for error. With this, just doing eight tubes. What I found with PCRing is these, right now I'm doing a pretty, uh, a pretty small region of DNA. I'm using it, doing a kind of standard, a standard size um, region. I'm trying to amplify regions of DNA that are about uh, five to six hundred base pairs long. That's actually the range is usually pretty easy to do. You gotta put some of this stuff back in the fridge and then I'm gonna take this stuff out to the fire. Sure. Okay. So I'm gonna change my tape. Okay. So it's a song about a guy who travels around the countryside breeding genetically modified pets. <laughs> his woman left him and he's got some other problems too. We're sorry, Mom. <laughs> and I've never played it like this, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Like a Canadian bridge. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> la 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 la. Okay. We're dogging on the muggy oak tree. We're dogging. Feel free to like, I know, all like coyotes, like, whatever you want. You never really loved me, darling. You never did, and that's a fact. We're dogging on the muggy old tree. Half a jug of agar and no old PCR machine. I got a half a jug of agar and a 
an old PCR machine. I'm gonna let the acid bubble. I gotta keep that bottle clean. And I never seen so many colors. Not even in a dream. I gotta let the acid bubble go and keep that bottle clean. Casey uh, found a nice little spot down here for electrophoresis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Big a spot as any. This little jar can go here. That's going to be our what we call the tip jar. Yeah, this is the the gel I was. We made this afternoon. This is just a very standard agarose gel. And then I need the liquid here, thanks. Uh, a buffer solution. This buffer is so that um, I'm gonna basically make an electrical field here. And the buffer is so that um, the field is consistent. Yeah, but see, it's the water looks lower, there, looks higher there, right? Than here? Yeah, it's higher this right? side. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that looks perfect. Okay. I'll get these all set up and ready to roll. Song is gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm running a electrophoresis gel, which is the technical term for what is usually called, you know, DNA fingerprinting or genetic imaging or whatever. It's just a way of uh, testing uh, the size of the DNA that you have. And so I'm just testing by testing the size, the, how many base pairs are in each, are in my DNA samples. I'll determine a little bit about my own identity and hopefully well hopefully we'll even be able to determine something about my identity because we did this PCR over the flames last night of the fire and if it worked we will then be able to tell certain things about me uh, whether I'm heterogeneous or homogeneous for certain kind of traits because one of the things I was looking at was the presence or absence of a of a gene called the ALU gene and that's like a kind of a standard marker in populations uh, because about one third of the people are homogeneous for, for one trait, another third are homogeneous for the other, and the third are, homo are heterogeneous, meaning that they have both. And we'll see which one I have. I, I, I don't know. Can, and then, you, can you speculate? Would you <laughs> yeah. Sort of what would you like? Uh, I mean, I, what would you like? I always think of myself as being a rather heterogeneous uh, fellow, uh, sort of uh, a mixture, you know? Not, no purity uh, in, in myself. So I would, I would expect that my DNA is likewise rather impure. I am a post-race kind of thinker, you know? I think race is a colonial construct, and thus uh, I'm against the whole notion of racialization, so in a way a lot of this work is... And how is that working that against the notion of race? Well, in this case, th th this is a little more playful because I'm doing this kind of more... Uh, 
I guess, 19th century kind of romantic notion of the individual. Uh, I don't know where it fits in there. There is something essentialist about that 19th century vision, but, uh, but I'm not, so, so in a way, I guess I'm complicating it with this, with this kind of work in this, in this uh, specific context. You're raising the problem rather than bringing the yeah, solution. Yes, yes, precisely, yes, precisely. And I, I, I think of it as a different way. I, I really think of this as post-biology. In what sense? Because I think, what I, I was seeing is was coming from Henri Atlan, yeah. who says that biology passed from being a science of observation to a biotechnology, because now yeah. it, it creates I, artifacts. I, I, I fully agree that it passed yeah. from being a science of observation. I think it passed from, being, from the science of observation to a, to a science of rationalization. That's why I consider it post-biology, because I think it's more informatic and statistical than it is necessarily biology. So Just in the same... is like removing biology from its own... Yeah, sure. We're, we're not even interested in, in cells. I mean, we're interested in DNA. DNA is not living, right? Uh, so we've passed from the notion of, I mean, in Foucaultian sense, he thinks about, you know, when we move from natural history yep. to, the, to biology, from, yep. it's, it's the beginning of, biology is about the, the, the study of life itself, right? We're beyond the study of life itself. Uh, if anything, we've grown kind of unconcerned with that. And what we're really fascinated with are these micro uh, these micromolecules inside of living things. Uh, so we've gone back to a kind of, we've, I think we've left biology at this point. In biology, the cell was, was the basic unit of yeah. life, and so it was, so it was really the, the sort of central object of study. Now, in a way, it's kind of a byproduct of, of informatics, right? I mean, informatics are, are the basic, are, are what life is, right? We can, we can strip these, uh, we can strip a cell down to nothingness and then kind of rebuild DNA molecularly. Uh, you know, uh, synthetically, yeah. and, and insert it, and thus DNA becomes now the sort of central unit of investigation. My, my critique is, I mean, I'm, I'm critical of this kind of essentialization, uh, you know, I'm, criti I'm critical of the kind of, uh, this sort of uh, uh, genetic determinism that comes with uh, this kind of um, strongly kind of DNA-centric science, but um, but I'm also, I think, just pointing out here that uh, we may have, we may have left, you know, the, the what, what we formally the, really described as, as biology, right? We may be in a different, not that biology doesn't still exist, but but the current era of techno of big science is not biology. I think it's post biology. So post bio art cream is more, <laughs> more appropriate. Yes. So it's happening. Yeah, it's happening. It's running a little slowly, but I think it's uh, working. Yeah, you can see how, particularly with the samples on the left and the, and the right, how the purple band is moving forward very quickly. Okay. It worked! Flawlessly! It worked? Every single lane. Wow. Yeah, 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 we just need to be in the perfect darkness. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, you can, you can come and look. Can I have a bit? Sorry. You go first. just need to have a hand up yeah. there. So those glowing bands oh, so bold. are all okay. are the different gene segments that, that were amplified. Oh, and and they, okay. I used very subtle variations uh, and my mixtures, so I was, mm -hmm. that's, why I was, that's why I'm getting more than one. Mm -hmm. They're very subtle variations. Mm -hmm. I was thinking maybe and one will And a single one is? So this basically is just, this was a region of a skin color gene, the SRC gene. Oh. oh. If we're getting these kind of yeah. really as, high as amounts as of DNA that, from uh, the over the campfire, um, yeah, I mean, it does kind of call into question the current <laughs> paradigm. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh.